Hello, it's Dr. Day Storms, and I wanted to give a brief overview on drug screening and confirmation methodology since I know that this can be confusing for an introductory forensic science class. One of the very first things that we need to discuss really have to do with this idea of a screening test versus a confirmation test. Okay, Much like the implies a screening test really is just a preliminary test that you use just to initially reduce the number of um, possible identities of an unknown substance. So let's say you have a, dr a possible drug and you're not sure what it is. You want to do something just to reduce that possibility down to a handful of drugs, hopefully, or if, if not fewer. And then a confirmation test or confirmatory test is one that will specifically identify what that substance is. Most likely, you may not have something, a confirmation test, within the field. Within the field, you usually do a screening test, but within the once you can take it back to the laboratory, you can do a confirmation test. Okay, so the four types of test methodologies that we'll be discussing are color tests and microcrystalline tests, which typically tend to be more on the idea of a screening test, chromatography, and spectrophotometry. And for these first two, for these first two, it's important for me, it's important to me for you to learn just the basics, but please don't memorize the specific chemicals used. Okay, because this is something that if you work in a laboratory, you get used to doing. Now, for the second two, the next two, for chromatography and spectrophotometry, I would like you to know more details about them. And we'll go into, uh, into those into a little bit more, in, into greater details. So, a color test, and there's examples down below, as you can see. Uh, let's see. So we have examples down here. There, what you do is you mix a specific reagent, or these chemical reagents, with what you think is a drug. And then you look to, specifically to see what color it produces. So this is a very good um, beginning in order to help screen, but it is not a confirmatory test. You can't use it for confirmation, okay? So it is not, not conclusive in that sense. Now... Some of the examples, there's Marquis reagent, and what happens is as you add the reagent to the suspected drug, it will change colors. It can kind of give you an idea of what you have. The microcrystalline test is more sensitive than a color test. And once again, you can actually add the chemical directly to the suspected drug, the reagent to the suspected drug, and it will form crystals. Both the color and the shape of the crystal product is indicative of the type of drug or the possible type of drug, okay? Now, that being said, it is more sensitive than the color test, but again, many times you're gonna to want to follow this up with a confirmatory test using chromatography or spectrophotometry. And we'll go over those in greater details in just a moment. Here are some examples down below. We have uh, how cocaine, what the cocaine crystal looks like whenever it's mixed with platinum chloride. Meth looks like with gold chloride. And GHB, which is gamma hydroxybutyrate, uh, roofing, so to speak, um, as it's commonly called, with silver nitrate. Now, chromatography, we're going to spend more details on. And this is a very important concept. Chromatography is simply a way to separate mixtures of components based off of the affinity between two phases. So what does that mean? So you can imagine that a drug many times is not pure, or it's really a mixture of things, mixture of components that, that, it's, that makes up that, it's called a solution. And so what happens is the different components will have different affinities on the process of chromatography. All chromatogra chromatographic methods have two phases. They have one which is called the stationary phase. The stationary phase, just like the name implies, does not move. Okay, then there's the mobile or moving phase which does move. There are different types of chromatography. Perhaps in different science classes, you've used 
this, um, like especially paper chromatography that seems to be used a lot of times where the stationary phase is a piece of paper and the mobile phase is the liquid that you dip just the edge of the paper in and then do the capillary action which is the same process like you know if you have a spill and you put the edge of a paper towel on it and it gets sucked up the paper the same thing happens with the solvent to the paper there and then what happens is the different components of the drug some of them will really like the liquid solvent the mobile phase and so it'll move up the piece of paper really fast other parts of it won't and so it'll stay near the bottom if or possibly won't even move at all okay then then the chromatography we're going to spend a little bit more time on with respect to seeing what the stationary versus liquid phase is column chromatography and then finally gas chromatography which in many ways is one of the gold standards of chromatography in that sense so once again for paper chromatography the stationary phase is a piece of paper paper doesn't move the mobile phase is a liquid it's called a solvent and you put a if we look at this actual example down here you see those little dots along the bottom and then they've labeled those that's where you take and you put just a drop of whatever the unknown substance or possible drug is then you stick this inside what's called a chamber and if you notice down here in this chamber, there's some solvent down towards the bottom, but it's got to be below. So, for example, on this piece of paper here, you wouldn't want your solvent line to be above right here. So just a small amount. Okay, I've included other videos as suggested, uh, as suggested um, examples on my fire. Okay, then what happens is the components of that drug or that whatever it is that you're trying to separate out, start to move up along with the mobile phase. Those components that really like the, the mobile phase move more quickly than those that don't move very slowly. So here, what we can see, whoops, what we can see on this side is the fact that we've got these different components. If we look at this, sample number two, versus usually you use standards. And so we can see a standard here where this spot matches up, presumably with that spot. And that spot, by the way, likes the mobile phase better than the one below it, okay, because it doesn't move as quickly. In thin layer chromatography, it's very similar to paper chromatography, except that you usually use a piece of plastic or a glass plate, and you coat that plate with a thin layer, hence the name, a thin layer of alumina or some type of silica base okay and so it's almost like a powder that dries on there and once again the mobile phase is a liquid solvent and it works the same same specifically the same as the paper chromatography except that instead of using paper the the backing of the sheet is more sturdy okay but you can see here that they were able to separate out the different components of the samples based off of their affinity for the mobile phase. I just wanted to show some examples that we've done actually in lab at Southeastern uh, just to show you that we have done this kind of thing before. Here, let me see if I can move it down. There we go. We use an improvised chamber. It was a glass jar in this instance here. We had three standards, S, D, and A, and then our unknown possible drug. You can't really tell, but they when it would, they would have gone ahead and put in, this is thin layer chromatography, by the way. They would put in a small layer of the solvent. The solvent would move up the thin layer due to capillary action. Then what we were able to do is because of the silica backing, on the the sheet it fluoresces and so we do what something that's called shadowing and so in this instance here it will leave this dark shadow wherever the sample is versus glowing kind of glows and so we have this was our standard s which has a sample right there the d and then the a and lo and behold our unknown actually was a mixture of all three 
in this instance for the sample that that student had prepared. <clears throat> Column chromatography is different in the sense that the stationary phase is actually inside a column. And usually it's some type of gel or beads. It is a solid that's inside this column. The mobile phase is a liquid solvent, but instead of running up, it runs down. You pour your sample on the top, and then more solution comes and flows down the column. And so this is called elution or eluate. We can see here the, the two colors, what is this, red and green? They have different affinities. Of course, they make a dark color when they're mixed together. But they have different affinities for the gel or for the solid inside the column here. And the red comes off first, followed by the green. But once again, we always have a stationary phase and a mobile phase for chromatography. This is examples here of students separating out components of a dye in one of the labs that we did on campus. This is an actual chromatography unit. It's called column chromatography unit. It's called a low pressure system. <clears throat> it's kind of difficult to see. This is where the whoops, where the students started to fill a column. This is the column. We're going to put the sample on here and have it elute. And we actually use a tubing that would wind up and around there to drop off individual samples into into uh, collection tubes. All right, this is just to show you what it looked like whenever the sample was first put on. Now we can see the components of the sample actually coming off. So we have the blue coming off first, the yellow, it's kind of like a fluorescent <laughs> color, which stays is retained on the column. It does not like the mobile phase that well, um, whereas the blue really likes the mobile phase. Now we see where the yellow starting to slowly come down to the bottom of the column. And then this is the final product where the students put them into two different beakers to show that they were able to successfully separate out the blue and the yellow. I, I would have personally preferred that they would have used the fraction collector tube so that way you'd be able to see them more clearly, but I got this directly from their lab report. Gas chromatography, in many instances, is kind of, you can almost think of it as being the, the gold standard of chromatography. <clears throat> there are multiple videos online and that I put links to on my fire that help distinguish and show you how to set up the gas chromatography system and also what it means. So there's a little cartoon that shows, using little colored beads, that shows how a gas chromatography system works. As with all chromatography systems, you have a stationary phase and a mobile phase. The stationary phase, there's a column. They show it in this little cartoon here as being a coil. Because these columns tend to be very, very, very thin. And they can be quite long. And this column inside is filled, filled with some type of filament or column material. Okay, And then the mobile phase, what makes this is a gas chromatography is a mobile phase is called it they use a carrier gas it's a gas that's usually inert something like nitrogen or oxygen or argon or something like that but that's that's um not so important right here um but what happens here is the fact that there's a gas that goes all the way through the column it's inert means it doesn't react with anything you stick your sample on and the sample also goes through the column as well. If it really likes the stationary phase, it takes much longer for it to go through. If it doesn't like the stationary phase, it goes through really quickly. Then you have a recorder here that senses it. And I called it recorder, I'm sorry. They have a, usually it's a light or a fluorescence of some sort that will sense it. And then it gets re physically recorded. So you always want to use a standard. This is actually looking at cocaine. The way that they measure the gas chromatography is according to what they call retention time, how long it takes for it to come off of the column. So here what we do is we have an internal standard, that way we can standardize or um, check the efficacy of our column. And then they put their sample on and lo and behold, you do get a peak 
that comes off at the time that would um, account for cocaine. And you can actually get an idea of both the purity and the relative amounts of the, each component based off of the area under the curve. Because if there's even more cocaine, perhaps it would look something like this. Well, that's, no, that didn't turn out very well. Please forgive my drawing abilities. But that, all this area under the curve then would be indicative of how much cocaine was in, present in the sample. This here is another example of a gas chromatogram. And it's looking at the different barbiturates. And so here they tell you really everything that you need to know. It tells you the gas chromatography, but it tells you the carrier gas, which they were using helium in their flow rate, what kind of column they were using, and like I said, the other details, if you were a specialist in this field, that would be more important. This is the retention time. This one goes from left to right. And lo and behold, the different components all come off at different times based off of, the, based off of how well that they like the actual column. And so, for example, one, which is methobarbital, didn't like the column very well, so it came off quickly. Whereas number 12, which is methobarbital, it had the highest affinity for the column, so it took the longest to come off. And we can even look at the relative areas under the, each of these curves to tell you the relative amounts with respect to each other of the components of the drug or drugs in question. Now spectroscopy, which is also called spectrophotometry, it's a little, it's, it's different. So what it does is it is based off of the absorption of light. And there are different types that are very important to forensic science. And so they call it the electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic radiation. Most of the time when we think of light, you're probably just thinking about visible light, the light that you can see with your eye. But there's also ultraviolet light, infrared light. There's the radio frequencies, which is actually used in an MR machine or MRI, if you've gone to the doctor and had an MRI. X-rays fall into to this, this category, um, which you know, for example, for broken bones and so on and so forth. But the two that are the most important for forensic science with drugs, looking at drugs, really have to do with the UV vis spectrophotometry within that portion of the spectrophotometer and IR. Okay, so just to go into a little more detail here, and on your own, if you're still struggling with it, you may want to take some time and reread that portion of the textbook, or even look up additional videos online. But the important thing here is the fact that this is the speed of light in a vacuum, and this was the electromagnetic spectrum that I was discussing. And see, some of the ones that you're probably um, used to talking about, you know, visible light, that's the light that you can actually see with your eyes. We have microwaves, radio frequencies, which like I said, that's also the kind of wavelengths that are used in an MRI machine. You have X-rays, so on and so forth. But speed of light in a vacuum, it is, a constant and there's an inverse proportion um, relationship between wavelength and frequency. Wavelength literally means the distance, the length between the top of one wave to the top of the next wave. Okay, so those that are um, lower in energy tend to have really big wavelengths. That's the reason why you, you, know, you don't have to worry about getting cancer by listening to the radio in your car. Whereas those that are highest in energy will have the shortest wavelengths. And those you would have to worry about possible damages. It's one of the reasons why you, don't, you want to limit the amount of x-ray exposure that you have. Okay. Frequency, though, is different. It's inversely proportional. So that means things that have the highest frequency will have the largest wavelengths. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Things that have the lowest frequency will have the largest wavelengths. Things with the highest frequency will have the lowest wavelengths. Sorry that I misspoke there. Okay. Frequency literally means the number of cycles or the number of waves, if you want to think of it, per unit time, per distance okay 
And so that's why sometimes, you know, we use frequency when we're talking about the radio dial, but many times in science, it's just easier for our brain to comprehend, at least for me, wavelength, because you just think, oh, really big waves versus really skinny waves. So a spectrophotometer literally just measures the amount of light that gets absorbed, absorbed at the different wavelengths of some substance. So here, for example, you have some type of light source. The light source gets focused so that way you can actually use a slit in order to specifically choose what wavelength that you want to look at. It shines through the sample. And then what happens is the detector just detects how much light gets absorbed versus how much light gets transmitted through the sample. So this is the UV Viz spectrophotometer, and this is actually one looking at different drugs. So we have here, for example, heroin, caffeine, and a morphine derivative. So once again, this is in the UV spectrum uh, wavelengths. And we can see that there have slightly differences in their peaks where their maximum absorption occurs. What happens here is it's not definitive. So we can see here, for example, we really can't tell morphine from, from caffeine. See, here's caffeine. It peaks up right around 280. This is probably around 284, 285. However, you can rule certain drugs out. If you had a really precise, you know, spectral phenomenon, you could say, oh, it's not such and such. Let's say that we had another drug that I'll draw in, and maybe, maybe it looks like this. You could say that drug in red that I just drew, it could rule that drug out because your sample really matched something in this re region here. So we could say it's possibly heroin caffeine or maybe morphine. So you can rule things out, but you can't specifically say it is X drug. Okay, so here's another example of drugs with differing UV. This is an anti-inflammatory that I found versus those that we just looked at. And so we can see here in the anti-inflammatory, it's maximum is almost at 310, whereas the, the opiates and caffeine had maximum right around 280. Here's an anabolic steroid, and it has a maximum of 250. So we could rule out, if our sample that we ran was around 280, we could say for sure, look, it's not a, this anabolic steroid, it's not this anti-inflammatory, you know, it's possibly one of these three drugs. Now we're going to talk about infrared spectrophotometry. Infrared looks at light in the IR region. Okay, our eyes can't see infrared light, but it exists. Just like you can't see an x-ray, but it exists, right? You can see the effects of the x-ray. Well, what's awesome about infrared spectrophotometry is the sense that it gives a fingerprint. It is a unique individual characteristic. If we think about that from the beginning of the semester, remember that is a characteristic that is specifically for that drug. It gives what's called a fingerprint region. Okay, so let's see what some examples are. Here, this is an IR of an anabolic steroid that I found. And for many times, for people in, in my field, they really like to look at this part of the spectrum, okay? So, it once again, you would just inject your sample into the IR spectrophotometer. It shines a light on it in the IR spectrum wavelengths, and then it measures the absorbance of transmittance, how much light goes, gets absorbed or gets transmitted through the sample. And it does this as a function of its, they, they use something called wave numbers instead of wavelength, but it's related. And many times people in my field, we would like to look at this portion of the IR because it tells you some of the unique, uh, it, well, not unique. It tells you some of the 
chemically important regions of the molecule, like if we were trying to build or make more chemicals or drugs. But it's this region down here at this end that just looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. That's actually a fingerprint. Okay, they even call this region on the right-hand side at really low wave numbers, they call this the fingerprint region. And it is a unique region of the IR spectrum. So every chemical would have its own fingerprint. And so you can actually match drug samples together. We could look at different types and say, yes, they came from the same batch, so on and so forth, because of the fact that they have the same fingerprint. Okay, it is a unique characteristic. Here's just a couple more examples. Um, well, once again, this was the anabolic steroid, and this is a, an amphetamine. And so we can see here that, yes, there are differences on the left-hand side, but if we look at these, and they give them, this reads out the numbers of the peaks, they're quite different. We have one at, you know, 570, but we have another one here at 601. We have a really long one at 745, but the longest one on this side is at I think this is about 1650. And so you can actually determine for people who are spectroscopists and look at this, they could look at the sample here and they could say that these do not match. You can run it through the database and come up and say, look, in the IR database, yes, this sample is an anamphetamine. I hope that this has helped explain some of the the screening methods like uh, the microcrystalline and the color tests, as well as some of the um, more conclusive methods like chromatography. And you, if whenever you follow that up with, with the, especially with the IR spectroscopy, you can actually get a confirmation test. For additional resources, please look at um, some of the other suggested resources on my fire or do some research on your own there's lots of videos out there showing how to read these spectra uh, spectra uh, spectrophotometry results as well as just showing you the actual machines that are used thank you and i hope you have a great day